Today, computer hacking has many forms that come with varying levels of inconvenience and fear, from cracking computer passwords, stealing social security numbers, holding data for ransom, or infiltrating the power grid. Hackers, who we believe now were Russian hackers, took down the power for a quarter million Ukrainians in three regions of the country. And not only that, but their attacks are evolving. The word hacking often means something illegal, but it wasn't always so. The original hackers didn't spy on you using your computer's webcam. They were nerdy kids, mostly, tempted by the thrill of a complex and largely invisible network and the technical challenge of mastering it. What they accomplished was disruptive, but not always illegal. Today's technical hijinks make us rightly nervous, but there was a time that hacking was almost, well, wholesome, and the crime was excessive curiosity. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, the first of two episodes on hacking, we look at the original practitioners. They are the teenagers and scofflaws who, in the 1950s and 1960s, hacked into the telephone system. Today, the term hacking has grown to encompass cyber warfare, but also do-it-yourself biohacking, extreme diets, and even hacking the climate through geoengineering. We'll consider those, but first, go back to where it all began. This episode, Plan of a Hack. Once upon a time, before the internet, there was already another communications network that spun its own web around the globe. It too connected far-flung people and places through state-of-the-art technology. This required physical wires, but the interconnectivity was just as magical. The long-distance telephone network was cutting edge and sophisticated. I'm glad to have this opportunity to tell you about the telephone switching center of tomorrow. The electronic central office, which is made possible by the magic of the transistor and other tiny but amazing devices invented by the Bell Telephone Laboratory. Perhaps you remember these early telephone days. The clicks of a dial on a rotary phone. The frequent sound of a busy signal. Dialing zero to reach an operator. Operator, what city, please? And that you had to limit the extent of your ambulatory movement to the length of a phone cord. Yep, kids, the rotary phone really existed somewhere in that time frame before the first flip phone and after the Cretaceous period. The telephone system was one of the first global communications networks in a league with the telegraph and ancient Roman roads. It offered an opportunity for connection and, of course, for technical hijinks. In the 1950s and 1960s, a small group of nerdy teenagers and renegade engineers seized upon both. Their efforts to find clever ways of tapping into the Bell, later the AT&T, telephone system to explore its invisible channels united them in a subculture defined not by ripping people off, but by an obsession to map and master an internetworked system. Author Phil Lapsley says these original hackers were called phone freaks. If you think about what a hacker is, the hacker has two different meanings today. But the good meaning of hacker is somebody who is simply intensely curious and passionate about a subject and really wants to get in and play with it and understand it. So whether you're hacking the phone system to understand how it works or whether you're hacking a computer system to understand how it works, it's the same same. Of course, the other definition of hacker is somebody who wants to misuse a system, who maybe wants to steal something to make trouble for others. And you can do that on phone systems just like you can on computers. But while the motivation of phone freaking would change in the following decades, in these earlier years, it was curiosity. So how could the phone freaks, after lifting up the receiver, make their way around the phone system? Well, the answer was to use multi-frequency tones that the newly automated telephone system used to route calls. Young men in the 1950s, like David Condon, figured out how to mimic tones to fool the system into placing long-distance calls. Okay, once you made a free long-distance call, you were breaking the law, but moving through the system was not, says Phil Lapsley. He's the author of Exploding the Phone, the untold story of the teenagers and outlaws who hacked Ma Bell. He reminds us what the telecommunication system was like way back then. 
when I first started writing this book, somebody said, you know, the first thing you're going to need is a time machine because <laughs> what you're writing about is going to seem like ancient history, and it really <laughs> is. You go back to the invention of the telephone, and it starts out as this really simple, like, wires that literally get connected together, and that's how people talk to one another. And the whole system over the course of 100 years slowly becomes mechanized. And so you move from a world where operators are plugging jacks into big, big switchboards like you see in the movies from the 1930s and 40s and 50s to a world where slowly the system is being automated, where you have these fantastically complex electromechanical machines for connecting wires together, right, and for allowing you to make your call. You know, the whole thing by around the 1950s and 60s is starting to be controlled by tones. And so people are using things like touch tones to be able to make calls. They're also using the old rotary dial, if you remember that, where you put your finger in the nine and you dial it over and it goes tick, 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 tick. And, you know, what you might not know is every one of those pulses is actually causing a piece of electromechanical switching equipment to actually move someplace in the bowels of the telephone company. And just to emphasize that the difference between an electromagnetic device, which was the dial phones, mm -hmm. and then a touchtone phone, which used electronic device, which was a transistor, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's the difference. You can kind of think of it as like the difference between a digital clock and an old school analog clock, right? In the analog clock, there's actually like gears and springs and ratchets and pawls that are like moving stuff, and you can watch the clock go tick, tick, tick. Whereas in the digital clock, it's silent. There's nothing. It just, you know, it's just like a little electronic circuit inside. And so the phone system made this transition from like the early 1900s when it was entirely manual. It was operators plugging wires into, into plugs to a kind of mechanical system where there were actual machines with moving parts that would connect wires from point A to point B to kind of a electronic thing where you're starting to get now into the 1980s where things are being transmitted digitally and you don't really have so many moving parts. The entire telephone network, somebody once said, is the largest machine in the world. It is something that circles the entire planet and it is made up of all of these ranges of technology from electromechanical things with moving parts to high-tech digital to people connecting things. And so it's this amazing sort of living organism of different parts. Okay, so the phone freaks, did they get in on that moment where we went from dial phones to touch phones, or were they using dial phones? They were originally using dial phones. So the, the first phone freaks that I was able to trace down when I wrote Exploding the Phone, uh, there was a guy in 1955, and he was really interesting. His name was David Condon, and he figured out both kind of from his knowledge and his interest in the phone system and also by like listening to how operators made long distance calls back in 1955, he realized that they used this special tone and the tone was not used to dial calls. Believe it or not, the tone was used to get the attention of another human being operator. So if you wanted to make a call from one place to another and it was a long distance call, the operator would take her cord, she'd plug it into a jack, and she would make this tone, which was a thousand hertz modulated by 20 hertz. And it sounds sort of like something like that. That's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, that would cause a lamp to flash on the other operator's switchboard. And so the other operator would know, aha, call coming in, I better answer it. And David Condon in 1955 was walking through a Woolworths store when he heard a demonstration of something called a Davy Crockett cat and canary bird call whistle. And what this was was a little plastic whistle, toy whistle, you'd blow into it, and it had a little spinny part which would kind of modulate the tone so you'd get that kind of quality to it. And he instantly knew what he could do with that whistle, and so he took it home, he proceeded to modify it in a bunch of different ways, he hooked it up to some equipment he had, uh, he was a chemistry student so he had access to a, a few pieces of equipment, and modified it until it made this 1000 hertz by 20 hertz tone. And then what he could do is he could make a long distance call going through another operator, and then use this whistle to get the attention of the remote operator and then instruct that operator to reroute his call or do something else for him. Now, you mentioned that the operator was a she, and we should say that the operators back then, they were all female, so... Yes, and this actually posed a problem for David Condon because he wasn't female, he was male. And so if he got on the phone and made this whistle and then was talking to a female operator and was trying to pretend to be an operator, well, that wasn't going to fly because they'd be like, who are you? You can't really be an operator. Even in his most impressive falsetto. Indeed. And so his solution to this was two things. One is he figured out, well, he could pretend to be a maintenance technician. And so he could pretend to be somebody who is a switchboard technician. And of course, 
thanks to the times, those tended to be men. And so then he could get away with some of that. Or as he put it, well, I would get a girlfriend and I would take her on a date to make free phone calls and have her impersonate being an operator. <laughs> was so, there ever a second date? Yeah, one wonders. <laughs> um, but he said he had a great time doing that. I don't know if the girl had a great time doing it or not, but that was how he amused himself in, in the late 1950s. So what are the order of events? You pick up the phone, and for anyone who doesn't remember this, there would be a dial tone, right? Yes, there would. Okay, and then you'd, you'd call or the operator would come on. But let's say the operator comes on, you call, you get the operator, and then he would say something and then blow his whistle? Or? Yeah, so what, in the case of David Condon, he would ask for a long-distance operator, which, again, you have, kind of have to get in the Wayback Machine back when there wasn't just <laughs> a, a normal operator, but there was a long-distance operator who handled special long-distance calls. And he would then ask to make a phone call, and the operator would put him through, and there would probably be a couple of intermediate points. So if you wanted to call Chicago from, say, Nashville, Tennessee, you might have to go through a couple intermediate cities. Then once the call had been placed, he could then get on the line with his whistle, blow the whistle, and get the attention of one of the intermediate operators, and then have the intermediate operator route him to someplace else that he wanted to call. And so his goal, if he wanted to make a free or low-cost call, would be figure out the shortest call that I can make that involves at least one intermediate step so that I'm not getting billed very much, so it's a short call. And then as soon as I go through that intermediate step, use my whistle to get the attention of that intermediate operator and then have my girlfriend pretend to be an operator to reroute the call someplace else. What was interesting about a lot of these guys that were doing this in terms of what motivated them the motivation was not to place free calls per se, because as you write, they were students. A lot of them didn't have anyone to talk to. No, that's exactly right. And the motivation in, in almost all of these cases was a combination of curiosity and then the thrill of being able to get away with something, right? Someone once said, there is nothing sweeter than getting something for free, even if you don't need it, right? So in the case of the phone freaks, phone hackers that I talk about in the book, their motivation was they would come up with this idea, hey, based on everything I've seen, I bet if I do this thing, I can make a free phone call, I can route my call from here to there, I can do something that normally I wouldn't be able to do. And as one of the phone freaks I had talked to said, once you have a hypothesis, once you have a theory about something, he said it's almost a sin not to test it, right? You have to try it out. And so it becomes just the scratching of a curious itch. If I do this, will it work? And then once I've done it, what can I do with it? It was, seems like it's a particular kind of curiosity, though, wedded with an ability to visualize complex systems and abstract systems and make them concrete yeah. in their mind. Yeah, and I think that, that is one of the things when you look at like computer hackers today, you know, people will often ask me, how does phone freaking relate to computer hacking today? And it's the same genetic material. It's the same kind of curiosity. As you said, it's the same ability to visualize a system, perhaps a system that thousands or tens of thousands of people have already visualized, but you have something in your brain that allows you to see a vulnerability or a flaw or a chink in an armor that nobody else did. And it's one of these things also that's funny because once you explain what the vulnerability was, oftentimes people are like, oh, well, that's so obvious. It's like, well, if it was so obvious, why did this one guy see it, but 10,000 other people didn't? Okay, so, so that was David's experience, but there were many other phone freaks, and it sounds as though they would hear about each other or they would just discover how to do this on their own. So it was being reinvented over and over. You have Jake Locke in your book, which is a pseudonym, which is interesting and mysterious on its own. Uh, Charlie Pine, Tony Locke, Paul Heckel, many others. Yeah, um, Ed Ross. Ed Ross. And were they learning from each other or were they all figuring this out on their own, and were they figuring it out the same methods, yeah. through the same routes? Yeah, this is a great question, and this was actually one of, you know, talking about scratching a, a curious itch, one of the motivations I had when I wrote the book was to try and understand, well, who came up with these ideas, and where did they get the ideas, and was there a common place, or did everybody just figure this stuff out on their own, or, or what? So. What I found was was a really interesting thing. There were definitely some groups of people. There were multiple independent groups, and this is through kind of the 19, late 50s, early 60s, going up into the 1970s. Um, 
there were a bunch of people who independently discovered these things on their own. Some of them discovered them by doing things like reading telephone company journals. Uh, the AT&T and Bell Laboratories used to publish a thing called the Bell Systems Technical Journal, which came out every month. And it was a lovely and super geeky and technical report on what the phone company has been doing in the last month. And some people would read that. And if they had that particular kind of brain that we talked about before, they would be able to see the vulnerability in what was being described. Other people would tend to connect with one another. So the kind of a thing where, you know, you end up talking to somebody and it turns out, oh, that's interesting. You seem to be interested in telephones, too. And you start to have a conversation and pretty soon, oh, you figured out these three things to do with the phone. And I figured out these two. So maybe we should put our heads together and we'll share those five and maybe we'll come up with a sixth or seventh or something like that. But it's a hobby for people. And so it becomes this sort of strange clandestine hobby with this loosely connected network of people. So you've got, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area phone freaks and some of them know the phone freaks at Cambridge who are at MIT and some of them know some of the Harvard kids and they're connected in turn to some guys in Tennessee. So it was really interesting because it was sort of this it's, uh, as one, one person said, it's an illegal hobby, right? You're doing this thing that it could potentially get you in trouble with at least the telephone company and law enforcement. Although not all of it was illegal. Not all of it out. was, yes. Like, you could get in there and you could make these calls, but once you avoided paying for the calls, that's where it became illegal? That's right, yeah. So exactly, it was, it was as soon as you got to the point where you were actually placing a call that you should have paid for, that was when, as far as the phone company was concerned, you were stealing from them. We'll hear more from Phil Lapsley in a moment. Uh, you know, Molly, he said the use of girlfriends or at least dates to imitate the operators because the operators were all female. But that wasn't the way it began, actually. In the 19th century, when they first needed operators, they, they used young guys. They were men. But those guys didn't work out. They began to fight with the customers and fight with one <laughs> another. And they brought in women. And the women did a great job. So, you know, uh, that was one of the first opportunities for women to get jobs, I suppose. So to be clear how these operators were being used and how um, the phone freaks were able to work the system while operators were unwittingly helping them. In the 1950s, to make a long distance call, you would call up and you'd ask for an operator first, right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember that. You would dial zero, you hear operator, and then you say, I, I'd like to make a long distance phone call, please. And she would click, 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 and you would hear long distance, and then you said, okay, I'd like to call New York City, here's the number, whatever it is. So you ask for an operator, and that's when David Condon got in there with his <laughs> Davy Crockett whistle? Yeah, right. He, he first asked for that long-distance operator who puts you in touch with the next uh, long-distance operator. And at that point, he's able to get to the one after that, the, the operator after that, by using this, this whistle that was tuned, <laughs> this Davy Crockett whistle that was reconfigured to produce a 1,000 hertz tone with this 20 hertz modulation. So it was like, you know, that, that kind of tone. And after that, you know, he could go anywhere he want because he would just essentially light up the board at the next switchboard and, and, and tell that operator, hey, you know, she sees this, it's going to be long distance, and she would you know, take you to the next level as long as she heard a believable voice at the, the front end. Coming up, why 2600 hertz was the key frequency to unlocking the phone system and how a blind teenager learned to mimic it. Plus, how phone freaks finally drew the attention of the feds. This is the first of two episodes that explore hacking. You're listening to Plan of a Hack on Big Picture Science. Hello? A click call from whom? My brother Rob? Okay, operator, put him through. Hello, is that you, Sam? Yeah, hey Rob, I can't talk right now, I'm doing a radio show. Hey, what are you doing calling me collect anyway? Well, I'm over at Barbara's place and I don't want to run up her phone bill. Oh, well, what do you need? Well, can you give me uh, David's number? Well, I actually don't have it on me. Have you tried calling directory assistance? It's toll free, you know. Well, not anymore. No. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what you could do? Call Emily. I mean, that's a local call. Oh, good idea. I'll do it. All right, Rob. I'll talk to you later. And could you return my belt sander when you get back to California? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. It rubbed me the wrong way anyway. <laughs> I'm sure it did. Bye. Bye. 
The phone freaks, the original hackers, continued to take advantage of the telephone system even as it became more technically sophisticated. As we heard, the first years of the network relied on operators who would patch through your call on big switchboards, but eventually the system became more and more automated. Replacing the human-operated switching system required a language, you know, a series of signals that machines could understand, high-pitched tones that opened up lines or routed calls. As Phil Lapsley said, some early phone freaks like David Condon used toy whistles to produce a thousand hertz tone to get to long distance operators. But when, a decade later, automated signaling systems started using a 2600 hertz tone to mark their long distance, their their trunk lines, some phone freaks built electronic devices, they were called blue boxes, that generated that tone. But one very young man, Joe Angresia, was actually able to mimic the tone needed to make long-distance calls with his mouth. Phil Lapsley tells that story and also explains the hacker activity that ultimately raised suspicion by the feds. By about the 1960s, most of the long-distance telephone network in the United States had become automated. And it was based on these tones. And so what would happen was, say you were you had uh, two switching offices for the phone company, so what the phone company called central offices. Let's say one is in Seattle and one is in New York. And they have what are called trunk lines, which are basically long distance lines, which are running between them. When those lines were idle in the 1960s, the phone company would put a special tone on the line, and that tone happened to be 2600 hertz. If you're a musician, you'd know that as seventh octave E. And I can't quite whistle it. I used to be able to. It's going to be somewhere above this. That's probably about 1800 hertz. Um, but it's a high pitch tone. And the reason the phone company did this is the phone company said, OK, we have a problem. We want to put as many telephone conversations on a piece of wire or a piece of cable or a microwave circuit as we possibly can. So how can we compress all of those conversations together? And they said, OK, we know that the human voice uh, you know, is somewhere between 300 hertz and 3,000 hertz. Now, if you're a, uh, a musical aficionado, you'll be shocked by that because you'll say, oh, 3,000 hertz, that's so low frequency. I mean, I can hear up to 18,000 hertz. It's true, you can. But the phone company is not trying to deliver a high fidelity audio experience. They're just trying to get as many voices as they can onto a piece of wire. So they figured out 300 to 3,000 hertz is about right. And so they chose this idle line marker as kind of up at the high end of that range, and it ended up being 2,600 hertz. And we should be clear what you mean by an idle line marker. So when the when the line was not being used, you heard this you, yeah, tone. Now, and, and when I say you, or when you say you, the thing that is hearing that tone is mostly the telephone company's switching machinery. So normally, under normal circumstances, a human doesn't really ever hear this 2600 hertz tone, except very, very faintly in the background. But most people wouldn't even notice that. Did these guys hear it? Yes, they did. And so one of the one of the, the stories I talk about in the book, there was a kid named Joe Ingressia. And Joe Ingressia was one of the first phone freaks he was, uh, he'd been blind since birth. He was really obsessed with the telephone and with technology. Since when he was little, like two years old. Yeah. No, <laughs> when he was three or four years old, he remembers crawling around the, uh, the floor, as he said, singing in his tuneless way, I'm a telephone man forever. He really wanted to be, he wanted to be, to work for the phone company, and he was just obsessed with phones. So he talks about, at one point, being on a call to a, a long distance call when he was like seven years old. <laughs> and hearing this tone in the background very faintly. And he started whistling along with it. And when he whistled along with it, the phone line hung up. And he didn't understand why. And so he did it again, because he's obsessive. And every time he would whistle that tone, the phone line would hang up. So the phone hanging up is different from the phone line being idle. Well, they're related. So let me me explain what's going on here. So if you have, like we were saying, between Seattle and New York, you've got these switching, switching machines in Seattle and, and New York, and they've got a trunk line, long distance line between them. When that line's not in use, the equipment puts 2600 hertz on the line. And that's just basically a way so that, you know, if you're in New York and you need a spare line to, you need a, to make a phone call to Seattle, you want to pick a line that's not in use, right? You don't want to crash into somebody else's conversation. So you find a line that has 2600 hertz on it and you say, great, that's my line. So now I'm, I, New York, the New York switching equipment is going to turn off 2600 hertz. Seattle is going to hear, oh, New York just shut off 2600 hertz on that end. It probably wants to make a call to me. So I'm going to briefly 
turn off 2600 hertz just for like a quarter of a second, and that's called a wink. You can think of it as a handshake. That's how Seattle tells New York, okay, I see you want to make a call in New York. Go ahead and send me the number you want to call. Now, the way New York did this in the 1960s was by sending what are called multi-frequency or MF digits. These are a lot like touch tones, but they're different tones. So they sound, and they're, they're pretty fast paced, and they sound something like this. And there's a, there's a first digit, which is something called key pulse, and then there's the seven or 10 digits of the phone number you're dialing, and then there's a final digit called start. So New York would send that to Seattle, and Seattle would say, oh, great, okay, great, I've got a phone number, now I can actually place the call. Presumably, if you're in New York calling Seattle, probably the call is to some place up in the Washington area, right? So the Seattle switching equipment would make that local call, and now the customer can talk to somebody in Seattle. Here's the thing. If a guy in New York happens to whistle 2600 hertz into the phone, that 2600 hertz goes into his phone, down that long distance line, and Seattle suddenly hears 2600 hertz. When the Seattle switching equipment hears 2600 hertz, it thinks, oh, New York must have put 2600 hertz on the phone line, probably because the guy in New York hung up. I guess I'll hang up the call too. So we're gonna terminate the call. But if the person in New York just whistled 2600 hertz very briefly, just like, then what happens is the call gets reset, the call gets hung up, but now the 2600 hertz has gone away. So now Seattle is saying, oh, New York took 2600 hertz away. It must wanna make another phone call. So this explains why when Joe Ingressia whistled his 2600 hertz on a long distance call, it would hang up the call. But that was only half the battle. It then turned out, if you could either make those MF digits that we talked about, if you could generate those on your, on your own, um, using a device kind of like a touchtone phone, or if you could just whistle pulses of 2600 hertz, you could tell the Seattle central office, dial me a call. So that would allow you to basically reroute a call that you made. So you, you've you gotten the attention of Seattle yep. through your whistling. And now how do you get it to call? Yeah, what happens next? What happens next? <laughs> so so now what you would do is one of two things. Either you're going to make the, if you can if you can mimic these same tones that New York would have sent, but for some different phone number. So if you can send the tones for key pulse and then a seven or 10 digit phone number that you want and then start, Seattle will then dial that call for you, even if it's not in the Seattle area. So you could have it dial overseas, you could have it dial to Alaska, you could have it dial anywhere, and Seattle would gladly do that for you. If you didn't have the ability to make these multi-frequency tones that we talked about, it turns out on some circuits, you could actually just whistle little blips of 2600 hertz because that's how older switching equipment worked. So as an example, if you wanted to dial a call in New York, which let's say starts with area code 212, you would send pulses of 2600 hertz that would sound something like this. So that was two pulses followed by one, followed by two. Again, my 2600 hertz rendition leaves something to be desired. <laughs> um, but you could dial an entire phone number that way. And in fact, this Joe Ingressia kid got to the point where he could whistle dial calls like that anywhere he wanted, pretty much on command. And by the time he got to college, he was charging people a dollar to call anywhere in the US. Now, how was he avoiding and how did these other phone freaks avoid paying for these long distance calls? Yeah, it's a great question. So in the example I just gave you where we're calling from New York to Seattle, we're paying whatever that long distance rate is, right? Back in the day though, there were two telephone number types that didn't cost anything. One of them was directory assistance. I don't know if you remember, you used to be able to dial area code 555-1212. This predates Google. And uh, you could talk to an information operator and get somebody's phone number. That call was a long distance call, but it cost zero cents per minute, it was free. Or you could call an 800 number, which was also a long distance call, but was free. So now imagine the following. I'm in New York. I call, let's say we'll call Portland long distance, 503-555-1212. I'm about to talk to a long distance operator in Portland. I'm being billed zero cents per minute for that call. Right before the operator answers, I send 2600 hertz down the line. Portland has now said, oh, I guess he hung up. Oh wait, no, he wants to make another call. Where, do, where, where should you call? I send whatever phone number I want. I call you know, California, any place, which would normally cost me money. Portland will reroute the call to there, but New York is the one who's responsible for billing me, because New York's where I live, and New York already knows, oh no, I have it written down right here. 
He's talking via a directory assistance call. Directory assistance is free. So therefore, this whole call is free. Now, wouldn't the, the operator, though, in directory assistance hear you whistle into the phone? Um, she would probably not so much hear the whistle. What she would probably hear would be something like a call came in on her position, and she started to answer it, and then it just hung up. So she wouldn't actually she wouldn't actually really see that. But then doesn't she isn't she aware that you are talking to someone still that the, the phone call still went through? Um, the interesting thing is because the system had become sufficiently op, uh, automated at that point, she would never even really see that. Right? The the uh, she w- it would be sort of like the equivalent of you were at your home. Think of yourself as as a as a directory assistance operator. You were at your home. Your phone rang. You picked it up to be of some use to somebody, like, what number do you need? And all of a sudden, the line was dead. That was all that the operator would see, because the switching equipment had already rerouted the call by that time. If, if you couldn't whistle, if you weren't born with that skill, like Joe Ingressia was, you could use a device. And that's where the blue box comes in. And that's In fact, there were black boxes, too, right? There were, yes. There Very were, quickly, there were, what was the difference? There were all sorts of colored boxes that, that, that the phone freaks invented. A blue box was a device that exactly as you said, allowed you to mimic these tones that were called multi-frequency tones. And the name came from the fact that the very first one the phone company ever managed to get its hands on after they uh, they uh, busted a, a kid who had built one happened to be in a blue metal enclosure. So henceforth, it was known as a blue box. A black box, in contrast, was a very simple device. It was just a few dollars worth of components. It was like a resistor, a capacitor, a few other items, very simple stuff. And what it allowed you to do was receive phone calls at no cost to the person calling you. And the way it worked was basically it made, you would attach this to your phone line. So if you were calling me, if I have a black box on my phone line and you're calling me a long distance, when you would call me, I would f- throw a switch on the black box. And what it makes it look like is if I have never answered the phone. So as far as the phone company is concerned, this was a call that just rang and rang and rang. And oh my goodness, she was persistent. She let this phone <laughs> ring for an hour and a half, when in reality, we actually had connected and we were talking. But uh, the phone company billing equipment did not know that. OK, so how does the phone company cotton on to what's happening along with the feds? They begin noticing unusual patterns of activity, in, even back in the 50s and the early 60s. And, and what were those patterns? Yeah, so a, a few things started to happen. Um, one is the phone company simply started to get to get wind of things. They would find out that, you know, they talked to somebody and, oh, did you hear that you know, we found this equipment? Well, what is this equipment? I don't know what it does. Let's look at it. So Bell Laboratories had an active program to kind of investigate well, what are these things we're seeing. Then there were also strange patterns that you would see in the telephone network. Like a lot of directory assistance calls. For example. <laughs> so look at that. You know, this, the, these, all these calls are being made to directory assistance numbers when normally, you know, we get 35 calls a day and now we're getting 350 calls a day. That's pretty weird. And, you know, if you're the phone company, you start to investigate that, not necessarily because you suspect fraud, but just because, well, maybe something's messed up with our network, right? We've got to kind of stay on top of it. Another thing that they saw was... When you would make a call to a directory assistance number, there was something that was called answering supervision. And this was basically an indication that the remote party had answered and that you could start billing for the call. Now, normally when you call a directory assistance number, there is no, the answering supervision is not returned, meaning those are not billable calls. So there should never be a signal sent back saying, yep, directory assistance answered, you can start billing because we don't bill for directory assistance. The problem being, if you use a blue box, for example, to reroute that call from a directory assistance number to you know, your Aunt Ethel that you want to talk to on the phone, when Aunt Ethel picks up the phone, the system automatically sends this supervisory signal back saying you can start billing. Now the phone company is looking at this weird thing when they're looking at their data at the end of the month because, wow, there were all these calls made to directory assistance numbers, but they all marked as answered. But we know that directory assistance calls shouldn't ever really be marked as answered because we don't bill for them. So again, probably this is just indicative of some sort of problem we have in our switching equipment. But then when they start to look into it, they find out, well, maybe it's not a problem with the switching equipment. Maybe it's a problem with this subscriber who's doing something. We'll hear more from Phil Lapsley in a moment. Earlier in the show, we heard how whistles at 1,000 hertz allowed phone freaks to make their way through the system, and now we hear uh, the the 2,600 hertz was the key frequency. What does that say about the bandwidth of the phone system back then? Well, the bandwidth of the phone system was decided on the basis of, you know, what's the minimum bandwidth you need 
to understand the person at the other end, you know, the human voice. And you, the human voice has a very wide range. You can ask Pavarotti about that. But all you need for a phone conversation is, as he said, 300 to 3,000 hertz. That's not very much. So all the signaling that they were doing to direct your call had to be tones within that range. So 1,000 hertz is within that range. 2,600 hertz is in that range. But, of course, you can hear that with your ears. So the point is you wouldn't have anything that's lower or much higher than that because it wouldn't be audible. Well, it wouldn't make it through the phone system. You'd get lost. The phone system's designed, yeah, not to give you hi-fi, just to give you understandable speech. Now, the deal about the 2,600 hertz was that was used to mark the trunk lines, the long-distance phone lines, as you know, either being in use or not being in use, as, as he mentioned. And by manipulating that, by sort of artificially opening up a line legitimately, making a legitimate phone call, long-distance phone call, but then sending 2,600 hertz down it, you could turn off the phone call you were paying for, then immediately start making other phone calls because the line could be tricked into thinking it was still open. Look, the way I look at it is, I don't know, the idea that the 2,600 hertz was sort of like a pass key into a boutique hotel, you know, normally locked at night, but you got this 2,600 hertz pass key, so you can get into the lobby, and then you would use, uh, you know, other devices to make the other tones that would get you into a specific room, which is to say, the person you're trying to call. Coming up, how phone freaks compare with today's computer hackers. This is the first of two episodes that explore hacking. This episode, Plan of a Hack. On Big Picture Science. Eventually, the jig was up. Eventually, the phone company and the feds caught up with the phone freaks. They had left telltale footprints, not unlike the footprints of computer hackers today, a pattern of unusual activity that shows that someone has snuck into your system. But what made the phone network vulnerable in the first place? Of course, any new technology is going to attract technophiles who want to test its boundaries and find alternative uses for it. But in this case, the system was created with vulnerabilities built in. In some ways, it draws a parallel with the internet, which was designed to be open without security in mind. Except that the phone system wasn't designed to be an open system. It was a closed system that people could pay for, run by a private company. And that for-profit company, AT&T, wanted to watch its bottom line as it adapted to the times, switching from the human-driven operator system to an automated one. And so it made a business decision and repurposed the millions and millions of miles of copper wire already in place from the earliest operator days, really from the days of Alexander Graham Bell. AT&T from the start had all these copper wires running everywhere and it had operators plugging jacks and you know plugs into jacks and talking to each other and the entire business of this network of wire is getting the human voice from point A to point B and doing so cheaply and reliably. And as they started to realize in the 1920s and the 1930s that they were going to have to modernize and they were going to have to start investing in automation and mechanical switching equipment. But when they started putting in these automated systems, they had to be compatible with the network that they had built. And so everything was based on, for example, sending tones that we talked about to switch your phone calls from point A to point B. All of those tones were in the human voice band and they were used on the same wires that human beings would talk over because that was cheap, that was economical, made good business sense. The problem is what it meant was that the same pair of wires that we're using to have a conversation between two people was also the same pair of wires that was connecting you to the switching equipment and that these tones would be sent over. So if I could hear you and you could hear me, it meant the switching equipment could hear us, and it meant if we could imitate being switching equipment, the switching equipment would pay attention to us. And so the, you know, the, that term was called in-band signaling, meaning the signaling, these tones that you'd send back and forth, were done over the same band, the same pair of wires as your voice. And that was a big security problem for AT&T. It was even worse than a big security problem. It was a security problem they couldn't fix overnight because their entire system has been architected this way. We've run 
millions of miles, I don't know, maybe billions of miles of copper wire switching equipment. The entire system is predicated on we're going to have wires that are going to carry both signaling information and voice. And that's not a thing you change overnight. It's not Microsoft sending out, oh, hey, by the way, here's a new software update to get rid of a bug in Windows. This is physical stuff you got to change. So it doesn't change overnight. Your example there of humans getting on the on the line and, and whistling to fool the machines is kind of the reverse of the Turing test, isn't it? So the Turing test is kind of machine fool a human into thinking the machine is a human. And here we have humans fooling the machine to thinking it's another machine. That is beautiful. I've never heard that analogy before, but that's beautiful. Okay, so the feds eventually come knocking on the doors of some of these young men, and they were caught. And, and as you said, you've given many clues as to why they were caught. But what was interesting is that the phone company was really reluctant to go after these guys because it would just draw a lot of attention to what they were doing. And I wonder if you could say a word about that. And um, are there any parallels with that today? Yeah. So this is this is to me fascinating. So, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a telephone company executive. You've just figured out that you have this massive security problem that any kid who can whistle or any college student who's good at assembling some basic electronics can make free phone calls and do all the stuff that you don't want them to do on your network. What do you do? And one of the things they figured out pretty quickly was, well, the first thing you do is you keep quiet about it, right? Because the last thing you want is this information getting out in the newspapers, right? Because every time it gets out in the newspapers, all that happens is more people say, well, that's a neat idea. I never thought to do that. Maybe I'll try that. So the problem they rapidly ran into was if you, if you bust somebody, if you have the police come and arrest some kid, oftentimes you have two problems. One is it often doesn't look good from a publicity standpoint of like we, the giant phone company at the time, the largest corporation on earth, have just had the police arrest uh, and we're going to prosecute a blind kid yeah. for whistling. You know, if you're if you're a PR guy for the phone company, this is not a thing you want to see in the newspaper. As they would say today, right? the optics. The are optics no are good. poor. Yeah. Um, so then the second problem is, as you said, every time that happens and the newspaper article is written, then the word gets out about it and the problem spreads, right? And so that's that's a problem. So the phone company ended up adopting this sort of wait and watch strategy where they would try to keep things as quiet as they could. And this was up until about 1971. And if something happened, they would slap people on the wrist. They would take away their blue box. They would not really go to full prosecution because when you do full prosecution, you get news and you get coverage and this sort of thing that they didn't want to do. So the phone company had this problem and they realized that they had to keep things quiet. And, and the fewer people who knew about this vulnerability, the better. And you see this today. When someone comes out today with a new vulnerability, a new exploit in, in the cyber world, right, in, in the modern computer security world, the goal is to keep that as quiet as you can because the more people who know about it, the worse news it is for you, right? So if you're Microsoft and you have this vulnerability, you don't, especially if it's going to take you three or four weeks or a month or two months to patch that vulnerability, you don't want anybody knowing about it right? That doesn't do anybody any good. So the goal there is to kind of keep things quiet. And you see this a lot. Nowadays, if you are a hacker, if you're a, a, a hacker who's found a vulnerability, you're probably going to keep it quiet as opposed to just posting it on the internet. Or if you're responsible, you're going to call the company and give them a chance to fix it before you go public with the exploit. Because as soon as you go public with the exploit, even if you didn't mean any harm, somebody else will and will use that exploit to their own ends. You know, we talked about you talked about what a definition of a hacker is, and it does seem as though the the phone freaks who were the hackers of the 50s and 60s, there's a kind of nostalgia around them, and it does seem innocent, whereas today it's hard to separate cyber hacking from a kind of notoriety and nefarious intent. You write in your book that there is a difference. I'm going to read your words back to you. Ready oh, for I this? That. Okay. There is a difference between mere curiosity and true crime, even if we cannot always clearly articulate what the difference is or what we should do about it when we recognize it. So this difference between curiosity and true crime obviously applies to the subject of your book of the phone freaks of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, would you say the same about cyber hacking today? Yeah, I would. And I think really, in some way, that question goes to intent in, in either case, whether it's phone freaking or cyber hacking. Was the intent to do harm or was the intent simply 
to try to do something that has never been done before, to try to explore something to, as I mentioned before, I had a theory and I wonder if that would work. So if somebody breaks into a computer but causes no harm and they are doing it simply to understand whether this security vulnerability is possible, you know, if, if this truly is a vulnerability or not, that to me is the sort of thing that is, does not really rise to the level of being a crime. Conversely, if somebody, and, and a, maybe a great example, a great physical example, is lock picking. If I want to pick locks because I'm fascinated by the challenge of picking locks, right? I have a, I have a lock and I have some lock picks and I'm going to learn how to pick locks. That does not seem like a crime to me. That seems like a perfectly reasonable hobby. If, on the other hand, I use my lock picks to break into Molly's house and steal her stuff, well, now that's the crime of breaking and entering and burglary. Right? But it is that the question there, the difference there is one of intent. And I think it's the same thing around computers. I think human beings have had millions of years of evolution. We're very good at reasoning about physical things, things that are made of atoms, right? We do, we do pretty well with that. Okay, I get it. Lock picking, that's curiosity. Breaking into Molly's house, that's a crime. When things become cyber stuff, when things are networks, when they're invisible, our intuition, our millions of years of evolution deserts us. And it becomes very easy to overreact and to be like, well, anything that anything that somebody's doing which isn't exactly 100% up and up, that must be a crime and that should be a federal crime and you should go to jail forever with that. And I think that is, it seems so quaint in looking at the phone freaks, but I, I assure you that the people in the phone company and the people in the government back in the 1960s, it didn't seem quaint to them then. It seemed really scary. It seemed like 14-year-old kids can get into our system and do stuff. Can you draw a direct line between the phone freaks of the 1950s and 60s and the cyber hackers today, meaning are they the grandfathers of hacking, or are they individual groups that developed around different technologies? I very much see the phone freaks of the 1950s and 60s as being the grandparents of computer hackers today, but, I, but I'm going to use computer hackers here in the most positive light I can, in the sense of people who are interested in learning about, exploring, and playing with computer systems and networks and understanding what they can do, who are following their curiosity and are trying to become better at their craft or their hobby. There are definitely also parallels between the people who were making free phone calls in the 1960s <laughs> and 70s and people today who are engaged in, in, in cyber crimes, meaning not just doing stuff for curiosity but for profit or for malintent or whatever. I think today the things that people were doing with things like ransomware are much more severe than making free phone calls. But I think you can also draw that, that historical parallel as well. Phil Lapsley is the author of Exploding the Phone, The Untold Story, now told, that's not part of the subtitle, The Untold Story of the Teenagers and Outlaws Who Hacked Ma Bell. Phil, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Molly. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's interesting to hear this history, now more than a half century old, about how the phone company, this massive organization with all this technology and its own R&D department, was still vulnerable to, if you will, Yankee ingenuity. Today we have similarly complex systems, and we have just as much ingenuity, I think. Well, the original definition of hacker, Phil Lapsley said, is someone who's intensely curious about a system and wants to get in and play with it and understand it. Of course, once you've done that, there is opportunity for misuse, and there was some of that with the phone freaks. The term hacking, however, has evolved. Today, it's applied to cyber hacks, but also do-it-yourself biohacking and even hacking the climate through geoengineering. In our second of two episodes on hacking, we'll examine these modern versions of hacking and whether they truly are hacks or whether it's even always a bad thing. Could you hack something to improve on it? That's in the second of our two big picture science episodes on hacking. Next time, angles of a hack.
Well, thanks to the team that always whistles while they work, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Daniel Marino. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the rings and moons of Saturn, everyone's favorite planet. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Plan of a Hack. The first of two episodes on the theme of hacking. Tune in to the second episode, Angles of a Hack. And if you want to hear still more Big Picture Science episodes, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because you figure those E&M waves can't be easily hacked, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like this show. 